Excuse number four that airlines use to justify why they don't take action on contrails. Adding more fuel and CO2 is unacceptable. When we redirect a flight to avoid contrails, it often increases the fuel burn, which directly impacts our costs and CO2 emissions. So adding fuel and CO2 with all that uncertainty is a hard sell when we're under pressure to meet fuel efficiency goals and net zero targets for CO2. The fuel penalty is unacceptable. So I think, well, I mean, this is the probably the first or second most common excuse that we see from from operators and others. It, it's it's partly a misconception, but it but it, it does come up a lot. I think the reason that the misconception arises is we often say that contrails and aviation CO two are of a similar magnitude, D- depending on what metric or time scale uh, you pick. You know, one might be slightly bigger than the other, but order of magnitude, they are they are roughly similar, certainly over you know, long time periods, like 100 years. Um, and if that's the case, then it's not possible that a 1% fuel burn penalty, which is the order of magnitude um, that we're talking about in terms of fuel burn penalty, is remotely comparable to contrail avoidance. And um, there's other reasons that this is um, slightly nonsensical. Um, one is that that fuel burn penalty is often measured against what we call a kind of perfect flight in which we fly an aircraft through airspace in a perfect manner. Well, that flight actually doesn't exist in, in the first place. Often in practice, what we sometimes find is operational control avoidance makes no difference to fuel burn because you know, the, the flight that we would otherwise have taken was also imperfect and it's just noise on that. And in fact, we think it will be quite difficult to measure um, if you look at, say, global aviation and its fuel burn after we've implemented um, global contrail avoidance, um, we don't think it will be very easy to detect the difference in fuel burn between uh, contrail avoidance and not contrail avoidance because it's in the noise of operational inefficiencies. Airspace inefficiencies are in the order of 10%. So the, the difference between perfect flights and the flights we actually take due to various airspace issues is about 10%. Some airspace reforms go hand in hand quite nicely with control avoidance. Some some more flexibility on vertical maneuvers, etc., um, would help with control avoidance and would actually reduce fuel burn. Um, and control avoidance is not an alternative to uh, CO two mitigation for aviation. It's a, it's a requirement in addition to the CO two target. So the two aren't being traded off against each other here. What we don't say to airlines is. Um, you can take all the life jackets out of the plane, which would actually reduce fuel burn because it would make the plane a bit lighter. Uh, if you can demonstrate that the trade-off with CO2 is worth enough to cancel out the lives that will on average be lost. Or similarly, you know, you can trade off some of your NOx emissions with your CO2 emissions. We, we, we tell operators, you must meet these minimum safety standards. You must meet these minimum NOx standards. We know this will make it marginally harder on your CO2 targets, but you're just going to have to factor that into CO2 targets. That doesn't mean your CO2 targets get watered down. Um, You still need to meet your CO2 targets. Contrails are very much like that. They are very independent of CO2. There is a small trade-off like there is to a degree with safety and NOx with uh, CO2. It's very small, and we should be worrying a lot less about this so-called trade-off between them. They are broadly independent problems, and we need to tackle them independently.